The Netflix Witcher series is finally here. I'm sure Netflix was hoping this will be the next Game of Thrones, but is it? It's not for me to judge because I was underwhelmed by Game of Thrones like three seasons before it was fashionable. I definitely enjoyed much of Netflix's Witcher series, but to be honest, I don't think it completely lived up to its potential. Season 1 is rarely the best season for any series, so the series might come into its own later. We'll have to see. As someone who's interested in real mythology and folklore, and how that translates into fictional world building, I was interested in the references this series made to real creatures of legend. I went over a few of these in my two previous previous videos on the creatures of Slavic folklore in The Witcher, which you can view by clicking on the upper right hand corner of the screen, but the Netflix series included a few more that I'd like to cover. So in this video, I will go over all the mythical creatures that reference real mythology or folklore in The Witcher Season 1, and this time I won't be limiting myself to specifically Slavic folklore. Sorry for any mispronunciations I make, let's get started. <laughs> The first monster we encounter in the opening sequence of the series is a Kikimora, a creature that I already covered in my second Witcher video, but I will go over it again quickly. In Slavic folklore, the Kikimora is a small house-dwelling creature that usually resembles a frail woman with chicken legs, and possibly also a beak. The Kikimora is usually troublesome and thought to be either the counterpart or the wife of the Domovoy, another house spirit. Of course, what I just described doesn't resemble what we see in the show or the Witcher video games at all. In Sapkowski's novels, the description of the Kikimora is a little vague, but it is described as spider-like, rather than an adorable chicken lady hiding in your fireplace. It marks the imminent return of Lilith, demon goddess of the night, sent to exterminate your human race. The wizard Stregobor mentions the curse of the Black Sun, saying it will mark the imminent return of the demon Lilith. Lilith is also referenced in the Witcher novel The Last Wish, very similar to how she is here. It was prophesied by ancient races of the continent that 60 women bearing gold crowns would prepare a path for the demon goddess to enter the continent, after which she will destroy the world. However, despite this, Lilith is worshipped in the East. Lilith is a pretty clear nod to Lilith, a figure from Jewish folklore who is often portrayed as a female demon. In fact, her name may be derived from the Mesopotamian demons called Lila. In some folklore, Lilith is known as a sexually wanton demon who steals children in the night, unless one wears the correct amulet to ward her off. In some sources, she was said to be created from the same soil as Adam for the purpose of being his wife. However, she refused this role. I am Tork, the Sylvan, a rare and intelligent creature! In this scene, we meet the rare and intelligent creature, Tork, the Sylvan. Sylvans are humanoid creatures that appear in both the games and books. They somewhat resemble the classic depiction of a fawn, with goat-like legs and two horns on their forehead. However, in the games, they are considerably more bulky than a typical fawn. Despite their nickname, Devil, Sylvans aren't inherently evil, although they do have a tendency toward mischief and trickery. As a member of the Free Elves, Tork the Sylvan has an understandable motive, but puts his mischievous nature to good use as a spy and thief. The Sylvan's name is adapted from Sylvanus, a Roman god of the forest and fields and protector of the wilderness. Sylvanus is sometimes depicted with the physical appearance of a fawn, like the Sylvans. He is adapted from the earlier Etruscan deity, Selvans, and also shares similarities with the Greek god, Pan, as well as his son, Silenus. It's a monster. A good luck. In this scene, the boy tells us that when a wolf passes over the grave of a woman who died while pregnant, the deceased infant becomes a Vukodlak. The Vukodlak are referenced in the Polish version of the Witcher short story, The Edge of the World. However, in the English version of the story, they are called Werebrawls. The creature the boy references here is derived from the Vrikolakas, an undead creature of Greek folklore. However, there are Slavic versions of the creature. For example, the Romanian Varkolak, or Polish Vilkoak. It's possible the name of this creature was derived from a Proto-Slavic word meaning wolf, and this creature is often associated with or identified as a werewolf or a vampire. Actually, it's not entirely clear which creature it resembles most, and is perhaps best described as a deadly, monstrous revenant like a vampire, or a werewolf, or something in between. Perhaps it doesn't matter much because, as we find out later, the boy's description is wrong. The creature that attacked him was in fact a Striga. This is another creature I covered in my previous Witcher videos. But will again. In The Witcher, the Striga is a monstrous, vampire-like revenant with long arms, razor-sharp claws, and teeth, which she uses to kill and drink the blood of whoever crosses her path. 
We find out later that the Striga is Princess Ada, who was cursed before birth by Ostrit, a courtier of her father, King Foltest. Geralt manages to reverse the curse by keeping the Striga out of her coffin until morning. In folklore, this creature is a variation of a vampire. In fact, Slavic folklore has almost as many variations of the vampire as the Inuit have words for snow. While there are many variations of the Striga, Sapkowski's version is likely based on the Striga of his native Polish folklore. These are blood-drinking monsters who emerge from the graves of people born with two hearts, two sets of teeth, or babies born with a full set of teeth. Often these people die young but return in the form of a striga, like Princess Ada, except that she was cursed. Okay, it's different. The ice cracked open and the Selkie Moor shot out. In this scene, we hear the tale of the Selkie Moor. This creature is not based on any from the books or games. Its name resembles a Selkie from Celtic folklore, which is a seal-like creature that can shed its skin and appear human, usually in the form of a woman. Based on the description in the series, the Selkie Moor is a very large water-dwelling creature, given that it swallowed Geralt whole and he had to cut his way out of its belly. Perhaps it's like a Selkie, but more? Huh? In this not very obvious flashback sequence, we witness the tale of Ciri's parents and how they were married. Ciri's grandmother, Queen Kalanthe, intended her daughter Pavetta to marry a pre-arranged suitor. However, Pavetta is in love with a walking, talking hedgehog. I mean the knight Duni, who storms into the feast, demanding Pavetta's hand in marriage. It might seem a little odd that Duni's curse transforms him into a hedgehog-like creature. If you aren't familiar with the Brothers Grimm fairy tale based on the older German legend, Hans, my hedgehog. In this tale, a half-human, half-hedgehog named Hans seeks the hand of a princess promised to him, but is denied by her father. Eventually, Hans wins the princess's hand, removes his hedgehog skin, and reveals himself to be a handsome young man, much like Duny after his curse is lifted by Calanthe. In this scene, we meet the Dryads, an all-female tribe of wood nymphs who reside in and protect the forest of Brokolon. They use the waters of Brokolon to convert those who they deem worthy of their band. Those who drink the water forget the past and are ensured no male progeny, a process which they attempt on Ciri. However, she eventually leaves the forest with a creature she believes to be the druid Mausak. The name Dryad and their race, Nymph, is a pretty clear reference to the nymphs of Greek mythology. Nymphs are supernatural beings or divine spirits associated associated with nature and the forest. Dryad is the name of one classification of nymph, associated with and thought to reside in oak trees. In fact, the word dryad is derived from the Greek word dries, meaning oak. However, dryads can be associated with trees in general, like the witcher's dryads and their forest. The name of the dryad queen, Ethne, is derived from a goddess of Irish mythology, Ethnu, daughter of the giant Balor and mother of the king of the Tuatha Dé Lú. Ciri is led from the forest by a creature who resembles Mausak, but is in fact a Doppler. In The Witcher, Dopplers are shapeshifters who can imitate anyone they encounter perfectly, provided they are of a similar body weight, and can even go so far as to absorb some of their memories. When not in the form of a pretty boy and admiring their own naked bodies in a mirror, the Dopplers may assume their own form, which is somewhat hideous, although they are described as long-nosed dwarves in the book. Dopplers have no clear counterpart in mythology, however their name is a reference to the German term doppelganger, which literally means double-goer. In folklore, the doppelganger is someone's unrelated exact double, and seeing one was thought to be a bad omen or sign of impending doom. The Dopplers, however, are not exactly doppelgangers, but rather shape-shifting mimics, a category that may include a number of creatures or gods from mythology. For example, the Norse god Loki, who is known to change his shape and identity to fool those around him. Horses. Ah. Because Geralt can't sleep, he spends days looking for a djinn. His trusty minstrel, Yaskir, aka Dandelion, opens the djinn's amphora, ensuring that the djinn must fulfill three wishes. In fact, that's what the title of the first Witcher book, The Last Wish, refers to. The last wish made by Geralt, which is never revealed. In Arabic mythology, jinn are human-like creatures made from a smokeless fire. The myth of wish-granting only developed in later folklore, perhaps most famously in the folktale of Aladdin. However, this belief is typically only attributed to one type of jinn, the Afrit, and is not mentioned in most older folklore. Basically, the wish-granting thing has become a bigger deal than it originally was. Just the cutest... 
most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any real folklore associated with the Harika by name. However, in the Witcher universe, the Harika is a creature mentioned in the Sword of Destiny said to be more rare than a dragon, which only proves how much of a dick Sir Ike is. I won't go too deep into dragon lore because it's so ubiquitous at this point. Also, the dragons of The Witcher seem to be more influenced by the dragons of Dungeons & Dragons. In The Witcher, as in D&D, dragons fall into different categories, some according to their color. In both sources, the gold dragon is one of the most powerful and rare. In D&D, these dragons spend much of their time in human form, as The Witcher's gold dragon does in the form of Borch. I should also note that dragons are a pretty big deal in Sapkowski's native Polish folklore, the most famous of which being the Wawel dragon, whose bones are supposedly on display at the Wawel Cathedral. What did I do? Let's begin. One of the most important races of the Witcher universe are the Elves. Elves, along with Dwarves, are among the Elder Races that inhabited the continent before the conjunction of spheres that brought men and monsters to the land. Both Elves and Dwarves are derived from Norse or Germanic folklore, as well as similar folklore from other parts of Europe. I won't go into much detail on either race because the Elves and Dwarves of the Witcher are more or less the same creatures we've come to know and love from the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. They get a lot of airtime, is what I'm saying. So I will end my list here. What references to real mythology or folklore did you notice in the first season of Netflix's Witcher series? Did I miss anything or get something wrong? Also, what did you think of the new Witcher series? Did it live up to the hype for you or fall short of it? I'd love to read your thoughts on this and more in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my two previous Witcher videos, which are linked on the screen. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and Thanks for watching, until next time.